religious background you might have or any person might have, a deacon can mean totally different things to different people. If you're among even the Roman Catholics or the, especially the Eastern Orthodox Church, the office of deacon is actually a ministerial title given to a, a lower level of clergy that assists the priest. If you're coming from a Southern Baptist background, the title of deacon is basically given to people who are you know, corporate board members, right? Managing the financial business of the church organization. Vastly different roles for the same title. Biblically speaking, what is a deacon? Where did the term originate? Well, on one hand, we can say deacon's deek, just like elders eld. There's a lot of truth to that. But what do we mean by that all? Well, we find the answer right here in Acts chapter 6. Granted, the title of deacon is not officially used, but it's here that the role has its foundation. At its most basic level, a deacon is a servant, and the reason the role exists is because there was a need. The church in Jerusalem was growing, and although there were 12 apostles, they couldn't do all of the work. More people were needed in order to minister to one another, and so deacons were born. Back up a little bit. Remember, the church had begun relatively small, <laughs> bigger than us in this room, but relatively small. Once Jesus ascended to heaven, there were 120 disciples in Jerusalem led by the 12 apostles. That changed on Pentecost. At a single morning, 3,000 people put their faith in the Lord. The believers loved each other, spent time with one another, devoted themselves to doctrine, fellowship, breaking bread and prayer. Things are going strong. Not even persecution could slow it down despite two attempts from the Sanhedrin to stop the apostles from teaching and, and healing in the name of Jesus. The apostles were faithful to their calling and their witness. They and all the church were bold in their speech and their actions. And God was continually working signs and wonders in Jerusalem, giving credence to the gospel of Jesus Christ. By Acts chapter 4, that number of 3,000 had jumped to 5,000. By Acts chapter 5, they stopped counting. Multitudes were coming to faith. The church is continuing to love each other. Landowners even selling off their property to ensure that Christians had enough to eat. Why? Because with more people comes more needs. To date, the 12 apostles led it all, but there were only 12 men. Like all humans, they had limitations. There are only 24 hours in a day. There's only so much attention we can dedicate to different things at different times. At a certain point, something is going to fall through the cracks, and that's what happened. The apostles needed help. The church needed the apostles, but they needed more than just apostles. They needed dedicated servants, people later known by the term of deacons. Now, in truth, the church needs more than apostles, pastors, deacons, and other titles. The church needs everyone. We are all servants of the Lord Jesus. Every single one of us is necessary in his kingdom work. We just need to be willing and available to serve. So we're going to start when they see the problem here in verses 1 and 2. Verse 1 says, Now in those days when the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists, because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Again, growing church brings growing needs. The church in Jerusalem now numbered well into the thousand, possibly close to 10,000 by this point. And it's inevitable with that sort of crowd that there's going to be problems that crop up along the way. Now, in this case, the problem comes from cultural bias, or at least some form of cultural misunderstanding. Scholars actually debate what exactly differentiated the Hebrews from the Hellenists, but most agree, at least at some point, that it involved language. Both groups were ethnically and religiously Jewish. Both offered sacrifices at the temple. Both looked forward to the promises of the Messiah and all the rest. Uh, where a person was born, geographically speaking, didn't matter so much, as what culture he or she identified with. We think of Paul, for instance. He was raised outside of Judea in the city of Tarsus, but he was still considered a Hebrew of Hebrews, and he was trained up to be a Pharisee. So you didn't have to be born in Judea to be considered a Hebrew, right? No matter where he was raised, he still dressed, at least at that point, as Saul. He dressed, spoke, and lived as a Jew. He was a Hebrew. The Hellenists, on the other hand, they were Jews that identified far more with Greek culture. Their primary language was Greek, rather than Aramaic. 
uh, colloquially known as Hebrew, but Aramaic, and they likely dressed more as Greco-Romans than they dressed as Judean Hebrews. And so it's probably inevitable that there arose a divide between these two groups now of Christians. Now, keep in mind, it wasn't that the Hebrews hated the Hellenists or, or vice versa. The problem seems to be one of neglect rather than intent. The Hellenist Hebrews, the Hellenist widows, I should say, not speaking the same language as the Hebrew widows, apparently didn't receive the same instruction as the Hebrews, and thus they didn't receive the same benevolent giving as the Hebrews. Luke writes that they were neglected in the daily distribution, and that could be translated that they were overlooked in the daily ministry or in the daily service. Widows were quite prevalent in Jerusalem. It was not uncommon for Jewish men to you know, move their families to Jerusalem in order to die in Jerusalem and be buried near the holy city. But what does that mean? That, that means that their widows are left there without friends and family around, without family support and income. And so the church helped fill the gap and provide for their needs. Yet if a Greek-speaking Jewish Christian didn't understand the Aramaic instruction of how to receive money or food, she misses out, she goes hungry. Language gap caused them to be missed, overlooked, neglected. Problem needs to be solved. And it's not really the only problem. It's a symptom of another problem. The, the reader of Acts, as we're going through this, we might note that this is the first time that this church was not of one accord, right? In the past, they were one heart, one mind, one purpose. Now there is a complaint. It could be translated a grumbling. There's a murmuring among the rest. Miscommunication led to misunderstanding, and that led to murmuring complaints. Now, if that sounds familiar, that's because that's a typical cycle among groups today, uh, probably especially among the modern church. Some miscommunication takes place, perhaps some misheard word, some poorly chosen phrase, some unclear direction, whatever the thing was. It wasn't intentional, just one of those things that happens to everyone. And that miscommunication led to misunderstandings and hurt feelings. Those things are natural, normal. It happens in any church. If you're around me long enough, I guarantee I will miscommunicate something and I will screw up in some way and I will owe you an apology of some sort. So just be used to that. That happens everywhere. What should happen at that point, ideally, is that people sit down, talk about it, be generous with grace, be quick to ask forgiveness, and be done with it. That's the sort of solution, by the way, that's biblical, according to Matthew 18. Two people sit down, they work it out, they hear each other be done. It gives glory to God. Sadly, what all happens all far too often is that people nurse their hurt feelings. They assume the worst of the other person, never really talking it out, not wanting to hear the other side of the story. They start grumbling about it with others. Rumors spread under the guise of prayer requests. People refuse to deal with it directly because no one wants to name names, and the problem spreads like rot. All of it could have been avoided if people just dealt with the problem biblically. Beloved, we want to do things biblically. Amen. We've all seen the way it shouldn't be, so let's do it the way things should be. We need to set the example to other Christians how to deal with problems. We will have problems, no question, but we don't have to let it devolve into grumbling and complaining. If we've got the option of doing things the right way, let's do it the right way. Now again, don't miss what's at the core of this problem here in Acts 6. What was missing in this early church is that previous state of one accord. We've used that word homothumadon before, which talks about that. That unity in all churches, no matter what size, be it a size of a hundred or a size of thousands, all church need unity. We all need common purpose, common goals, and we have a common person in the Lord Jesus. Our common purpose is the glory of God. Our common mission is the great commission. And our common joy is the love of Christ. Common power is that which is given us by God, the Holy Spirit. So we can have unity. So we need to strive to be united. And what, where this breaks down is when people stop seeking what we have in common and start seeking what we want on our own. Instead of seeking what Jesus wants for his church, we look to what I want, what we want 
We want our own individual needs met rather than looking in how Jesus can use us to meet the needs of others. We, we look to promote our own goals and ideas instead of serving the goals of Jesus and serving the goals of his kingdom. Unity is lost when selfishness breeds. And selfishness has no place in the church of Jesus Christ. Jesus was not selfish when he laid his life down on the cross and died for our sins. We have no right to be selfish in our response to the cross. Now, to this church's credit, this grumbling and complaining is recognized early on by the leadership, and they take action to address it. Look at verse 2. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. First, notice what took place. The twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples. The leadership comprised of the twelve apostles summoned the rest of the church. Now, although there are some issues that are better handled in private, or at least a small gathering of leaders, this was not one of them. See, this problem had spread to the entire congregation so it needed to be discussed among the entire congregation. This division between the Hebrews and the Hellenists apparently was not limited to a small group of people. How do we know that? They could have pulled those people aside and talked with them privately, talked to them personally. Apparently it was rampant among the thousands of Christians in Jerusalem. So the whole unity of the church body had been affected, and the only real way to address it is to do it head on, to bring the whole church together and talk about it they don't ignore the problem. They deal with it. Second thing we need to notice is that there were two ministries being discussed. There was the Word of God and the serving of tables. Now, the first is obvious. The teaching ministry of the apostles, that's the primary ministry in which they're engaged. This is something that these 12 men were uniquely qualified to do. They were the ones who spent three years with Jesus day in and day out from Jesus' baptism to his resurrection. And that includes, by the way, even Matthias, who was a replacement for Judas. That was one of the requirements for him to be made a, an apostle in Acts chapter 1, right? Remember that, verse 21 through 26. They were the ones who heard the majority of Jesus' teachings. They saw him perform uh, countless miracles. They were the ones who spent time with the risen Jesus after his resurrection from the grave. So there's no group that's more appropriate than the 12 apostles when it came to teaching Jesus' doctrine from the written scriptures because they knew how Jesus himself interpreted and applied those teachings from the scriptures. On the second ministry, well, that applied to the problem at hand. The daily distribution of verse 1 is the distribution of money and or food to the widows so that they could eat. It's one of the earliest forms of benevolent ministries found within the Christian church. Interestingly, the word for distribution and serve come from the same Greek root word. The one's a noun, the other's a verb. Distribution is diokonia, serve is diokoneo. Now you might hear in that the English transliteration deacon. Diokoneo, deacon. The basic ministry being that of service, ministry, performing duties. So you put it together with the apostles were observing, and there's a legitimate need for servants to serve. Widows are going hungry, and the church had food and resources available to help them. They just needed helpers to provide the help. So you've got two ministries expected of the apostles at the time. Ministry of the Word and this ministry of serving tables. The problem was is that it's not desirable, it's not pleasing, it's not proper for them to do it. Now, don't get the wrong idea. The apostles were not saying that serving tables for the widows was a bad ministry. They're just saying it wasn't the right one for them to perform. Both the Word service and table service were needed. It's just that the apostles were 12 men serving thousands, and their attention necessarily needed to be elsewhere. Both ministries were ministries, true services performed to the Lord by the Lord's power. They're just not the right ones to do it. So that's when they propose this solution in verses 3 and 4. Verse 3, Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. See, more people were needed. The apostles couldn't do it all, so other men needed to be found to perform this different ministry, this different service. Now, they ask for seven. Don't think there's something special about seven. There's not a magical thing about the number seven, anything like that here. It's just a cultural preference, okay? Jewish communities often had a group of seven men as administrators, took care of the financial items of the town, oversee those things. The need to serve these widows, 
fits the same sort of description, so it's natural that the apostles asked for seven men. Now, that said, they did have a few qualifications. Qualification number one is that they had to have a good reputation. Good reputation. It's interesting, this word for good reputation, it comes from the same word which we get our English word martyr. Okay, so you might say that these seven men had to have a good witness, that their testimony, among others, had to be clear. That makes sense, doesn't it? After all, how can the apostles solve a problem of division within the church if they appointed men who were known for being divisive? How can a problem of complaining be solved uh, by appointing people who are known to be gossips and grumblers? Right? Have a good reputation, known among others. Second qualification is that they had to be full of the Holy Spirit. And depending on what Bible translation you're following, it says Spirit or it says Holy Spirit. Uh, whether Luke included the word holy originally, that's kind of beside the point. There's no question contextually that's who he meant, the Holy Spirit. Now, at first glance, it might seem that the apostles are saying that these seven men needed to be saved. Being born of the Holy Spirit, sealed of the Holy Spirit. But if we think about this from a closer point of view, uh, it really seems to be something different. After all, these seven men were to be sought from among the multitude of disciples. By definition, if they are disciples of Jesus, they were born again. At this point, the apostles are not warning of false converts. No, what they meant is that these men needed to walk empowered by the Holy Spirit, which is something that not every born-again Christian does. Remember that Luke had described the apostles and the church as being repeatedly filled with the Spirit. We saw it in Acts 2.4, saw it in Acts 4.8, saw it in Acts 4.31. So that same habit needed to be the habit of these seven men. Again, it needs to be stressed, all Christians have the Holy Spirit. Despite the teachings of some, a person cannot even be a Christian without the new birth and indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Every Christian has the Holy Spirit. But born-again Christians do not necessarily walk in the power of the Holy Spirit being continually filled by Him. That's not something at which we have to guess. We can look around and see that with our own eyes. How many times have you seen born-again Christians struggle with habitual sin? Maybe even yourself. You've got something in your life you struggle against. It's not that you like the sin, you hate it. You're grieved by the sin, constantly repenting from it, constantly seeking Jesus' forgiveness, but somehow you feel trapped, unable to break the cycle. What's that? That is a Christian walking apart from the power of the Holy Spirit. That's a Christian trying to do things according to his or her carnal flesh instead of by the power of the Holy Spirit made available in Christ. Now, it doesn't have to be that way. Christians can and should walk empowered by the Spirit, freed from the slavery of sin, joyfully in a way that gives glory to God. Why would we choose to live as a slave when we've been freed by the Lord Jesus? Why live according to death when Jesus has given us life? To be freed by Christ and then go back to our previous slavery is ludicrous. Imagine in your mind a slave walking back to his captor and clamping the chains back on himself. That's totally illogical. Yet that's exactly what so many Christians do in their sin. We're called to walk in freedom, stay in the freedom that Jesus has given us. Walk in the Spirit, you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, according to Galatians 5.16. We don't want to be unwise, we want to understand what the will of the Lord is and be continually filled with the Holy Spirit, according to Ephesians 5.17 and 18. Live free, live empowered, live joyfully for Jesus. Those are the sorts of people sought out by the apostles as these deacons, as these servants. So that's the second qualification. Third qualification is that they had to be full of wisdom. Now, grammatically speaking, this might go hand in hand with being full of spirit, but, you know, thinking if they were full of the spirit, they'd also be full of wisdom. Now, the grammar doesn't demand that interpretation. You can look at this on its own, but even so, it's impossible to separate the requirement of wisdom from the spirit. How is that? Because there's a difference between the wisdom of men and the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God comes only through the spirit. Now, the basic idea here is that the men who were chosen to serve needed to have more than an ivory tower idea of theology. They needed practical know-how. But the reverse is true also. They need more than just business skill. They needed spiritual maturity. See, this idea and this issue of serving widows is more than an act of administration. This was a theological problem that had caused disunity in the church, so they needed to know how to best administer the church resources for this theological end or goal. They're not just trying to accomplish a task. They're doing a task for the Lord Jesus, for the glory of the Lord Jesus. 
So they need to know the best way of getting it done, but in a best way that would benefit the church for the glory of God. Guys, that's true with any ministry within a church congregation. It's got to be more than a task, got to be more than a goal. Is your ministry mowing the grass? Great. Don't just knock down weeds, mow for the glory of God. If your ministry is providing coffee and refreshment, great. But it's best than just, just an efficient way of getting the food out to people. Do it with the right attitude as an act of worship unto the Lord Jesus, loving the people. Church congregations need people of wisdom, but that wisdom cannot be divorced from worship. Because when that happens, you've got a smoothly operating social club, but you don't got a church. That said, the idea of wisdom involves this idea of competency. Church congregations have no business putting men and women into positions in which they're bound to fail. Skill is needed for certain tasks. During the reign of King David, a Levite by the name of Kenaniah was appointed to be in charge of the music because it says, because he was skillful, 1 Corinthians, or 1 Chronicles, I should say, 15 verse 22. When God gave instructions for the tabernacle to be built, he put the spirit of God and wisdom into men like Bezalel and Ohiliab because they were gifted artisans, Exodus 31. These people had the right skill for the job. They just needed the gift of the Holy Spirit, which God provided. So likewise, in the modern church, we need competent people to serve in the areas in which God has gifted them to serve. And you might be thinking, well, I don't know what that is. Well, what's your skill? What's your passion? Find a ministry that fits that and do what God has given you. Use what God has given you. If that ministry doesn't exist, you start it. <laughs> do what God has gifted you to do. So that's what was needed for these men or these deacons here doing this service. It wasn't the right fit for the apostles, but it would be the right fit for someone else. That said, what was the right fit for the apostles? Look at verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. See, that's it. That's it. They say prayer and the ministry of the word, that is their primary ministry. Those were their priorities. That doesn't mean that they refused to do anything else. Obviously, they continued to preach evangelistic sermons outside the church. They continued to work signs and wonders. By the time Acts 15 comes along, the apostles are seen settling disputes between churches. You know, that goes beyond prayer in the scriptures, included prayer in the scriptures, but it goes beyond it. So we know from the biblical record that they did more than prayer and Bible teaching, but these were the two things that they were to do the most. As apostles, or we might say as sent ones, specifically commissioned by the Lord Jesus to be his representatives to the world, telling others what Jesus had told them, giving eyewitness testimony of Jesus' resurrection, those men had to spend time in prayer and the word. The effectiveness of everything else within the church depended on those apostles' faithfulness to prayer and doctrine. What good would their evangelism be if they didn't know the prophetic scriptures that Jesus had fulfilled? What good would their witness be if they didn't spend time in prayer? How could they hope to lead the church in other matters if those two foundational things were neglected? Now, these things are listed as apostolic priorities, but they are also pastoral priorities. I want to be very clear here and careful not to give the wrong idea. By no means are pastors equivalent to apostles. But at this stage in the church, the apostles had a very pastoral role. In fact, some of the apostles always saw themselves as pastors, Peter being an example. He referred to himself in his writings as a fellow elder. He called other elders to shepherd or to pastor the flock of God. You can read about that in 1 Peter 5. You know, Jesus had called Peter, to feed and to tend his sheep, John 21. Pastoral roles and duties. Now, pastors do not have Peter's or John's or anybody else's apostolic authority, but we do share in some of these same apostolic priorities. So pastors are to also give themselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. You say, that sounds great. What does it mean? I'm so glad that you asked. <laughs> Should be obvious, right? Spend time in prayer and Bible study. Well, and to a large extent, yes. The book of Acts actually shows us a little bit of this, right? Shows us a bit of the prayer life of the apostles. In Acts chapter 1, they were seeking the Lord for a replacement for Judas. In Acts chapter 2, they were praying when they sought the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 4, when they were praying for boldness. Acts chapter 10, when Peter is personally up on the roof by himself praying, he receives a vision from the Lord about giving grace to the Gentiles and the rest. 
primarily find them in personal and group prayer. Obviously, there's little doubt that they did intercessory prayer for others as well as they prayed for healing and all the rest. The ministry of the Word among the apostles in the book of Acts seems a little bit more obvious. The church dedicated themselves to listening to the doctrine of the apostles. The apostles are shown continually teaching the church throughout the book of Acts. They're obviously well-versed in the scriptures, able to quote it when necessary, sprinkling verses throughout their messages. That's what it meant for the apostles in Acts. What does it mean for today? It means that pastors better be in the prayer and the Word. A pastor who does not pray is a poor pastor. Prayer is essential for the work of pastoral ministry. You know, like any occupation, it can be easy to fall into habits and ruts and just do the same thing you always do day in and day out. And that's bad enough when it comes to certain occupations like medicine. You know, doctors, nurses, PAs, they, they got to spend time individually with these patients because each patient has individual needs. It's also just as terrible when it comes to the care of God's people. How can the Word of God be taught if the teacher hasn't spent time with God? How can God's people be counseled if the counselor isn't himself dependent on God's counsel? You've got to remember that Jesus kept a regular habit of prayer so much so that his disciples asked him to teach them how to pray. If the Son of God thought it necessary to pray, how much more lowly pastors? And likewise, when it comes to the ministry or the service of the Word, we cannot teach what we first have not learned. We cannot proclaim what we do not understand. Paul exhorted Timothy to be extraordinarily careful with the Scriptures, being an excellent student of what had been carefully handed down. He wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2.15, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. An ashamed worker would be a worker who would be accountable for knowingly doing something wrong, being called to the carpet on it, Right, because pastors, as well as any teacher of the Bible, will be held accountable. James 3, 1, my brethren, let not many of you become teachers, knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. Those are sobering thoughts. Sobering warning, harsh warning, to receive a stricter judgment than others because of the way we handle God's word. And pastors who ignore prayer, pastors who ignore God's word, do so at their own peril. Just to promote themselves, promote their ministry, promote their ego, promote their book. We promote this book. Amen. The key for those in pastoral ministry to remember is that we are not just shepherds. We are stewards. This word and these people are not ours. They are the Lord's. And we must treat them carefully. And the only way we can do so is to spend much time and effort in prayer and in the Bible. Without that, we will flounder and fail, the potential of causing great harm to the bride of Christ. Now, practically speaking, in regard to the apostles, as well as today, for this situation, it meant that their time was already spoken for. Right? There was no time for serving tables of the widows as valuable as that ministry was. Jesus called the twelve to prayer in the word, and it fell to other godly men and women to do the rest. That is still the case today. Pastors are called to prayer and the word, and the rest of it falls to the men and women of God in the church congregation. Paul wrote this very thing to the Ephesian Christians, Ephesians 4, verses 11 and 12, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. What is it that pastor teachers do? Well, we do a work of the ministry, but we do not do the whole work of the ministry. The primary people who accomplish the work of the ministry is the church congregation. See, this is where prayer and the ministry of the word comes in. Personally speaking, these are the tools God has given me to equip you. And once you are equipped, you do the work of the ministry. You see something that needs doing? Do it. You need somebody, and know somebody that needs to hear the gospel? Tell her. Tell him. Is there a disagreement in which you have been brought into? Well, don't go run and tell the pastor. According to Paul, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself lest you also be tempted. Galatians 6.1 You have been equipped. You do the work. That's the way the body of Christ is supposed to work. 
Pastor is only one part, but we together, all together are many. We need one another within the church congregation to make it all work. To use Paul's analogy from 1 Corinthians 12, you might be an eye, somebody else may be a hand, I might be the little toe. All parts are necessary. We all need one another. Which, by the way, is one reason it's so important to come and be a part of the church. When you are not here, the rest of us lack. And if I might put it in this way, not to poke fingers, you do harm to other Christians by your willful, continual absence. It's like we cut off our hand and just left it in the room next door. We need one another within the body of Christ. So the problem's been recognized, proposals have been put forth. Well, what next? People are chosen. Look at verse 5 and 6. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. Now remember that the apostles had gathered the entire multitude of the church to make their case. Apparently they all agreed. Additionally, they, they all thought the idea was good, so they set about choosing the men to be these first unofficial deacons. Now, interestingly, all seven of these men have Greek names, perhaps a nod to the Greek widows, the Hellenists being overlooked. Now, the fact that they all have Greek names doesn't mean they were all necessarily Hellenists. Could have been a mix of Hebrews and Hellenists. But doubtless, there were Hellenists among this group. It goes a long way to establish trust, ensuring that these are men of you know, good reputation. As to the individuals that are listed here, Luke gives us specific introductions to, to Stephen and Philip, both of whom are going to be featured in the next several chapters, Acts 6 through 8. Uh, we know little to nothing about the rest of them. The final man, Nicholas, is described as a proselyte from Antioch. Tells us a little bit about his background. He was originally a convert to Judaism. That's what a proselyte was. Now he's a fulfilled Jew with his faith in Christ Jesus. Now that alone speaks highly of his reputation among the church because they entrusted a Gentile-born Jewish convert with this financial responsibility of caring for Hellenistic Jewish widows. That's pretty cool. By the way, I, I know sometimes you read Bible passages and certain questions just kind of pop out to you. Have you ever read this and wondered how these men were picked? Luke gives us the names, but he never says how they were chosen. Now remember the Jerusalem church numbered well into the thousands. Again, maybe even close to 10,000 by this point. How would these men, seven guys, stand apart from the rest of the thousands of Jerusalem Christians? Now outside of a specific revelation from God, of which we're not told, I think there's really only one possible answer. They were already known among the rest because they're already active among the rest. They're already serving. And not just names thrown up into the air and randomly chosen. No, these were men of good reputation. Implies that the rest of the church knew something about them. They had witnessed their earlier service, their earlier character, and they thought that these guys are obviously qualified for this deacon service. How are men and women chosen for servant leader roles today? Well, the best way is to look for those who are already serving. Why set somebody apart from a role of responsibility who has not already demonstrated responsibility? Look for somebody who's taken initiative in the past and actively demonstrates godly character today. And those men and women, they make themselves known. So once they're chosen, they laid hands on them, setting them apart from ministry. Uh, probably the apostles laid hand on them. The Greek, uh, the grammar actually indicates that the whole multitude laid hands on them. But either way, they're recognized as being called by God for the work. This is a formal way of one, praying for them as they begun, but two, just showing their specific calling. Basically, this is a form of ordination. It's a recognition by the church congregation of what God has already done. You, you think about ordination. You watch all these TV shows and people go online to get ordained so they can do a church service or a marriage service somewhere. Ordination is cheapened today uh, by false churches. True ordination is something different than a diploma mill. It's not a credential, right? It's not a diploma. It's recognition. It's what is it that God has done? Who is it that God has called the church just comes together in agreement with God, recognizing what God has done. That's ordination. Now, although this seems to be the foundation here of the role of deacon among the New Testament church, you might notice that no title has been given. 
They don't call these men deacons. Deacon Philip, Deacon Stephen. None was needed. You know, when Paul later wrote to Timothy of deacons, the only language he used called them servants. Now we read this in 1 Timothy 3, 8 through 10. Likewise, deacons must be reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy for money, holding the mystery of the faith with a pure conscience, but let them also first be tested. Let them, be serving, let them serve as deacons, being found blameless. Now, we referenced this word for deacon earlier. The word is diakonos. It's transliterated deacon. That's where we get the word from. But by itself, it is not a proper noun or title. The word was used by Matthew when Jesus spoke of humility among the disciples, saying each one of you needs to be the servant, the diakonos of another. Matthew 23, 11. In secular Greek, the primary word, meaning of the word diakonos, is a table waiter. In the New Testament, it took on a new meaning for servants of Christ. All Christians, in some way, are diakonos, are deacons. History and tradition is what made the term into a title. Titles aren't bad, I'm not saying that. But function is more important. The church needs people who are less concerned about the title of deacon and more concerned about just serving Jesus. Called to serve. Now with these men chosen to address the problem, what's next? Well, we get the payoff. Look at verse 7. Then the word of God spread, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. That's not a throwaway verse, by the way. Now, Luke doesn't write of how these seven men or these seven deacons fix the problem between the Hellenists and the Hebrews. doesn't write anything of their administration. Here's the men that were chosen, then it goes on. What does it go on to? It goes on to something vastly more important. See, instead of grumbling and complaining, existing among the church, church action is able to get back to what it's supposed to be doing all along. They were sharing the gospel. Problems taken care of. Now we can get back to work. Unified once more as a body, they're able to demonstrate the same love that they said Jesus gave at the cross, and the rest of the Jerusalem is able to see that they were just disciples of Jesus by their love for one another. John 13, 35. Their evangelism actually became so effective that even priests were getting saved. Not necessarily a reference to the high priest, by the way. There were up to, they say, about 8,000 different Levitical priests within Jerusalem at the time they divided the duty over the course of the year. Apparently, many of those priests were hearing the gospel. They were getting saved. Can you imagine what it would be to be a Jewish priest? Then going back into the temple to ministering to God, knowing how Jesus fulfilled all those things. Guys, what happens when the church stops fighting and stops and starts serving? People see Jesus. The most common complaint against Christianity today is that the church is what? Full of hypocrites. Christians don't act like Christ. There's too much infighting, too much hiding one's own sin, too much building one's own kingdom. Now, is the church full of hypocrites? Sure, I'm one. I'm sure you've been one at some point, too. We've all failed at some point. We don't live in our hypocrisy, however. We put those things aside. We seek to be unified in Christ Jesus. And once we get out of the way, that's when people see Jesus. That's what we want to strive to do. Put self aside, walk in the Spirit, and let people see Jesus. You know, for all that went on in the early church, it was inevitable that they'd eventually run into a problem. Division can happen among the best of friends and the closest of family members. Surely it happens between brothers and sisters in Christ. That doesn't mean we don't do anything. Problems that remain unaddressed remain unsolved. That's when grumbling begins. That complaining won't stop until something changes. And to the church's credit, they did something. They saw a need. They found servants to meet the need. Now, the apostles are involved, but they weren't the solution to the problem. The apostles had their own ministry, their own priorities. What they needed were other people within the body of Christ to take up their ministry service. You know, it's more than just a select few that are equipped by God, after all. It's all of us in the body of Christ. If you are saved, you are equipped to serve God. So all of us are equipped. How have you been equipped? How are you serving? How are you being a servant, a diakonos, a deacon for Jesus? There are many needs. Uh, Some are being met, some are recognized. 
You know, we've got ministries going on all over the place. Others are not yet recognized. Maybe there's just not the right person to see it and to serve. Pastors cannot and should not do it all. It's the church that are supposed to serve. Church is not a building. The church is the people, and the church is supposed to serve. You know, there are children that need men and women to teach them God's word and demonstrate his love to them. There are people who need to be visited by a friendly face and maybe given some food from time to time. There are resources that are given the church by God that require care and attention. You know, a lot of times we'll pray and we'll look around who might be qualified to serve. Most times we ought to look in the mirror. How is it that God has called you to serve? You do that. You serve Christ. Serve him diligently, serve him selflessly, and serve him joyfully. Of course, some of you can't serve Jesus because you don't know Jesus. Can't serve a Lord that's not your Lord. You need to make him your Lord. Church served, people got saved. Why did they need to be saved? Because they had sin in their life. And that sin needed to be forgiven. And Jesus offers forgiveness from sin. If you don't know the forgiveness of Jesus, you can today. You surrender your life to him. You recognize him as your Savior and Lord. You recognize him as the Son of God who died for your sins and rose from the cross. And you can know Jesus and his forgiveness. You can do that right now as we pray. Father, thank you so much for sending Jesus for us. Lord, for any among us today who do not yet know Jesus as their Savior, and Lord, I pray that today would be the day that they do so. Lord, as they heard a, a message that really applied more to born-again believers than anything else, I pray, Lord, that they would see that Jesus and his sacrifice, his resurrection, is behind it all. We could not do anything at all if it were not for Jesus forgiving us and making us the children of God. And Lord, I pray that that would be their desire, that they would be made the child of God, that they would have their sins forgiven. They would confess those things to you, ask for sweet forgiveness, ask for Jesus to be their Lord, to be their master, just surrender their whole lives to you. Help them entrust themselves fully unto Christ and save them. And Lord, for us here, I pray that we would serve joyfully, willingly. Not seeking attention for ourselves, seeking the glory of God. Use us, Lord, in the way that you best see fit so that others could be saved. Lord, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.